Life has a peculiar way of leading us to unexpected crossroads. My story began, not in a grand dramatic moment, but in the quiet monotony of routine. I had built my life around predictable days, work, home, and fleeting attempts to reconnect with family. Somewhere along the way, though, I became a shadow of the person I once aspired to be. It wasn't any single event that pushed me toward a new beginning. Rather, it was the accumulation of little realizations. A strained marriage, endless hours at work, and health warnings I naively ignored all contributed to a growing sense that I had lost control. When the memo came across my desk, it was as though the universe decided to shove me out of my stupor. As I scanned the contents of the memo, a cascade of unwelcome memories surged forward, ones I had desperately tried to bury. Amy, my ex-wife, whose betrayal had left scars I thought were healing, was now my superior, the head of my department. The irony wasn't lost on me. It felt like a cruel cosmic joke. While I had breathed a sigh of relief when our marriage ended, I hadn't anticipated its ghost reappearing in my professional life. Amy had always said I was a heart attack waiting to happen. She was right. My doctor warned me, but I didn't take it seriously, thinking I was just working hard for my family. Amy's ambitions were endless, and I was the one expected to provide, like I'd been raised to do. The mansion, the pool, the unused country club membership, none of it had brought us happiness. The woman who once held my heart was now poised to control my life once more. That was the final push I needed. I couldn't work under her, not after discovering all the men she'd been involved with. I finished packing my things, wrote my resignation letter, and left the office for good. As I walked out, I placed my resignation, phone, keys, and credit card on Megan's desk. It's been a pleasure, Megan. I wish you the best. You're a valuable employee. Don't let her mess with you, I said. Megan raised an eyebrow. So you're really leaving? Yes, I replied. I can't work for someone I don't respect. She's ruined that chance. I'm going to miss you, Sam, Megan said. She's going to be furious when she finds out. I've been trying to keep quiet about your schedule, but I feel bad. I should have said something sooner. Don't worry about it. You're just doing your job, I reassured her. I knew this was coming once the merger memo landed. There's nothing I've done here worth hiding. Okay, but what do I tell her? Megan asked, her voice laced with concern. Tell her the truth. She won't be able to make a scene over that. Just stick to your values, I advised. Megan chuckled softly. I shook her hand and kissed it gently. It's been a pleasure. I'll stay in touch. As I got into my car, a black limousine pulled up, and Amy stepped out with two well-dressed men. She looked every bit the professional, but I knew better. She was a high-priced escort with a title. Amy glanced around but didn't see me. I waited a minute, then drove off for the last time. I'd already settled everything, sold what I could, stored the rest. My doctor recommended a change of scenery, so I took his advice. Three months of traveling followed, and eventually I found a small town near the void. The people were friendly, the fishing great, and the climate mild. I rented a three-bedroom cottage by the lake, with an option to buy. It was exactly what I needed to start fresh. Sitting on the porch, sipping a cold drink, I reflected on how Amy had taken my sudden departure, I decided to call Megan the next day to find out how things were going at the office. Hey, Megan, it's Sam. How's everything? I asked. Sam, I was starting to think you'd disappeared off the planet, Megan replied. I laughed, enjoying the view of the water against my pontoon. Not quite, but the scenery here is amazing. Wish you were here. What's going on at work? You definitely stirred things up, Megan said. Amy's on a rampage, laying people off left and right. Kevin Paxton quit after a blow-up with her. She moved him from logistics to the basement archives. He hated it and resigned. That's a shame. Kevin was great, I said. What's she thinking? If she keeps this up, she'll ruin everything before she even starts. How's she been with you? Megan asked. Megan chuckled. She's frustrated. Tried to fire me on the first day for letting you go before she had a chance to talk to you. I told her I couldn't stop you. And then she said since I had no boss, I should pack up. I told her I'd sue the company and her if she fired me. I mentioned your name and she shut up real quick. Megan laughed again. Now I'm stuck as her secretary. I told her I expected a pay raise and she wasn't thrilled, but I got it. I Megan filled me in on the latest drama. Part of me was glad to hear Amy's plans were falling apart. I left for my own peace of mind, but it felt good to know I'd shaken things up. Still, I worried about how it would affect everyone else. The next morning, I ran out of sugar, so I stopped by a small store nearby. As I walked out, I almost bumped into a young couple. Behind the counter was a stressed-out woman in her 20s. Can I help you? She asked as her baby started crying. 
Looks like Junior needs a feed. I'll take care of the customers while you handle that, I offered. She looked relieved. Thanks, Sam. I'm Vivian, by the way. I took care of the customers at the gas pumps, washing windshields and chatting, then returned to the store. A man was browsing the fishing rods. Can I help you? I asked. Just looking around, he replied. I'm on a business trip and got stuck here while my car's in the shop. He seemed like a businessman and I almost saw myself in him. Noticing he was about to buy a cheap rod, I asked, Do you fish often? Not really, but I'd like to, he said. I smiled. I'm your guy. I convinced him to buy a better rod, promising he'd catch more fish and have more fun. I helped several more customers before Vivian finally got her daughter settled. Thank you, Sam, Vivian said. Things always get crazy when you least expect it. I grinned. It's like quantum mechanics. Don't ask me to explain it, though. Vivian's face twisted, and I quickly apologized. Sorry, I didn't mean anything by it. Vivian looked at me with sad eyes, a single tear frozen in the corner. Sam, it's not your fault, but I'm a widow, she said. Her husband Greg had been eliminated in a truck accident while on maneuvers with the Army Reserves. The worst part was that he never knew he was going to be a father. Bessie was likely conceived the night before he left. Vivian wiped away her tears. I think he would have been a good father. This place, the store, was one of his ideas. She gestured toward the building and the land. Over the next few weeks, I started helping out at the store whenever I could. Vivian was beautiful, and sure, I hadn't been satisfied in a long time, but it wasn't just that. It was about regaining my sense of self-worth. Amy's infidelity had shown me she didn't need me, that she didn't trust me to provide. That was the final blow. Vivian seemed to understand my need to help, and while she never directly asked, she was always appreciative when I did. Spending time with her made me feel good. She was fun, caring, and grateful exactly what I needed. One evening, on my way home, my phone rang. Hi, you're lucky you're not Secretary Sam. You wouldn't last a day with your phone manner, Megan teased. Hey, Megan, I replied. I had to wait until I got home to call, she explained. I wasn't sure if that witch was tapping my work phone, but I didn't want to take any chances. Sam, you need to be on guard. Amy's got a private investigator tracking you. She asked me to put him on your trail. I couldn't say no, but I'm warning you so you can lay low. I sighed. Has she made it her life's mission to provocate me? I don't know, Sam, Megan said. She's been working nonstop, trying to turn things around, but it's clearly taking a toll on her. She looks ten years older and has gained a lot of weight. Well, she can't be pregnant, I muttered. Maybe, but not by me, Megan laughed. I think it's all stress and too many trips to the freezer for ice cream. She's frantic to find you. She blames me for you leaving before she could talk to you. Jesus, I muttered again. Here's what I think, Megan said. Give her a week, then tell her a fake report came in saying they couldn't find you, but that your phone is real. Say you convinced me to talk to her. Are you sure? I asked, feeling excited by the idea. Sam, I really don't want to get involved, but you have to do what's best for you, Megan replied. Thanks, Megan. You take care of yourself first, I said. A week later, Megan texted me. PH no. 2BB today. Be ready for call. I laughed at her shorthand. The call came as expected. I answered, yes, Amy, what do you want? There was a brief pause before she snapped. What's that witch, my secretary, been up to? I hung up. She called again. Damn it, Sam, Amy said. I hung up again. Megan answered the next time. Are you going to talk to her or not? Megan asked. I grinned. Tell that witch to be polite and she might get more than two words out. I'm done with her trying to control me. Megan laughed. Got it. Talk soon. Five minutes later, Amy called again. Sam? She asked. Yes, Amy, what do you want? I replied. There was a long pause. Can I talk to you for a minute? She asked. I'm listening, I said. Another pause. Megan cried on your shoulder, Amy continued. What did she say? I asked, curiosity rising. Amy's great, Sam, she said. She's the only reason you're talking to me right now. If I were you, I'd be thanking her. So... What do you want? I asked, irritated. Amy sighed. I'm sorry, Sam, I've been under a lot of stress. Megan's been doing a good job, and I appreciate it. I knew she was trying to soften my frustration. Get to the point, Amy. What do you want? I heard Amy stifle a sob. Sam, I really need to talk to you. I need your advice. I thought we were a team, but you quit before I could explain anything. I snorted, annoyed. I saw the writing on the wall, Amy. Once I found out your company bought mine, there was no point in staying. I wasn't about to be humiliated again. So, 
have a good life, but I doubt I'll see you again. Please, Sam, she begged, almost crying. I know I don't deserve it, but I need 30 minutes to pitch my idea. Please, just give me a chance. I don't know who else to turn to. I clenched my teeth. All I wanted was to hang up, but I resisted. After a pause, I said, Okay, but I'm not chasing you. You need to meet me at my office. I'll have Megan let you know when and where. I ended the call, half expecting her to ring back, but the phone stayed quiet. The next day, Amy asked, Why do I have to go through Megan? Why can't you just give me Sam's address? Megan, gripping the steering wheel, snapped, Because Sam wants it this way. You meet him. He doesn't want to see you. If you don't like it, tough. But I'm not sticking around for your meeting. I was chopping vegetables for dinner when Megan called to say they were about 30 minutes away. I didn't want Amy to feel comfortable, so I kept busy, hoping it would throw her off. Fifteen minutes later, there was a knock on the door. It's open, I called. Megan walked in, smiling. Well, don't you look settled in here? I grinned back. Hi, Megan. Good to see you. You look great. Amy, standing behind Megan, looked anxious. Amy, I said flatly. Megan noticed the tension. I'm dying for a drink, she said, offering a friendly hug and kiss. Wine, beer, or coke? I held up my dirty hands. Want something to drink? I glanced at Amy. Amy lowered her gaze, sensing the coldness in my tone. Hi, Sam. A glass of wine would be nice. Megan's right. You look good. Megan opened a bottle of white wine and poured two glasses, handing one to Amy. Which way from the edge of the world? I want to admire the view. I'll leave you two alone, Megan said with a smirk. But remember, I'm not cleaning up any messes. She winked at me. Behave, I pointed to the back door. There's a fishing rod on the deck if you want to try your luck. Megan rolled her eyes. Not likely. I wouldn't know what to do with one. With that, she left, and I turned to Amy. Take a seat and tell me why you're here. Amy hesitated but sat down. She glanced around, trying to break the tension. Nice place. Small but nice, I replied, my irritation creeping out. This isn't small talk, Amy, I said, turning back to my chopping. Just say what you need to say, and we can both move on. Amy sighed took a sip of wine, and braced herself. Can I ask one question? I sighed. You can ask whatever you want, but that doesn't mean I'll answer. Just ask. Why did you leave? I turned to look at her, sensing she was waiting for me to snap. Over the years, she knew I fought to keep my temper in check. I dropped the knife and turned to face Amy. You don't need a rocket science degree to understand why I left, Amy. You're a VP now. You must have some brains. I think you can figure it out. Amy frowned, clearly irritated. That was low, Sam. I'm good at my job, but I can't read minds. I folded my arms and stared at her for a moment. You're right. But to be a good manager, you have to read people, understand their motives, and use their strengths. It's about finding a balance that benefits everyone. Do you really want to know what I think of your talents, Amy? I asked. She stiffened, sensing something harsh was coming. Still, she pressed on. Okay, Sam, what do you think of my corporate skills? I almost laughed at her challenge. You're a bulldozer, Amy. Subtlety and finesse aren't your thing. You plow through everything in your way, not considering anyone but yourself. She was stunned. Bulldozer? She asked, still processing. Yeah, Amy. You take the most direct path to your goals, without considering others. You don't analyze situations or think about who you might be hurting. You just barrel forward and burn bridges along the way. As I finished speaking, I noticed a tear forming in her eye. It was the first time she seemed truly vulnerable. No, I don't want to, she whispered. I sighed. Everything I did, I did for us. But your ego got in the way. I know I hurt you, and I'm sorry for that. If you'd stuck around, I could have explained my plan, she pressed. You still haven't told me why you left. I tasted the sauce and added some salt. I saw the writing on the wall, Amy. I knew you were brought in to clean house. You were the hatchet and I wasn't foolish enough to think I wouldn't be next, so I did what I had to do to make it easier for you. Her expression shifted, clearly eager for more. Sam Beckman, for a smart man, you sure do some stupid things. I wasn't planning to fire you. If you were any smarter, you'd know that, I replied. What I did, I did for us. I did it so you could achieve your dreams. She tried to sound sincere. That's a good trick. Tugs at my heartstrings while stroking my ego. But I never said you weren't good at that. I just hate that you're still playing me. I gave her an unimpressed look. I can't count the times we've sat around, talking about how the higher-ups are ruining the company. I believed in you, Sam. I still do. 
I worked hard to get your company back on track, to make it profitable. And now I have the chance to help turn your ideas into reality. I shook my head. Now it's the it's all your fault, Gambit. You've left me to struggle on my own without ever giving me a chance to explain. I've been working non-stop trying to make this work. All I need is a little help from the one person who should understand me best. It's you, Sam. I need you. Together, we could make this happen. I'm not naive enough to think we'll get back together even though I dream about it, I said. But if we focus, we can build a solid business relationship and succeed. So how about we call a truce? Let's work together and show them we're a force to be reckoned with. Amy took another sip from her wine and leaned back in her chair, letting me stand there in silence. Her passion had faded, and now it was up to me to respond. I had finished the sauce while she spoke and was now putting the spaghetti water on to boil. My mind kept going back to the same thought. Et tu, Brutus. Betrayal. This was what I thought when I first heard about her using the company for her own gain. Amy was attractive, but those three words, good Amy, summed up her actions. A good manager considers everything before making a decision, I said. Let's say I buy into your plan. Why do you think I can be useful to you? Her eyes narrowed, annoyed by my question. I've already told you, she replied. I believe you're capable and respected enough to get the support you need. The obstacles you faced before were with upper management, but that's changed now that I'm VP. You don't see it, do you? I said, my voice tinged with sadness. Your very presence here has undermined my ability to gain support. You refuse to acknowledge your role in that. Others see it differently. Amy frowned. Have you ever wondered why it's hard to get people behind you? The rumors about your business ethics are well known by now and I haven't said a word to fuel them. I could see her discomfort. This wasn't the conversation she wanted to have. People see you as someone who slept her way to the top, stepping on others to climb the corporate ladder, I continued. They know about our marriage, and it's the reason I couldn't work there anymore. When I divorced you, I kept my dignity and the respect of my colleagues. If I joined you now, it would be like saying everything you did was okay. I would lose their respect, and my work would suffer. Tears welled up in Amy's eyes, and I could see her belief in herself starting to crack. I don't believe you, Sam, she said, her voice trembling. I've worked hard. Jason wouldn't have given me the job if I wasn't capable. I shook my head, feeling a mix of anger and sadness. She still didn't see the truth. Did Jason come to you with the takeover offer or did you push him into it? Amy wiped her eyes with a tissue and sat up straighter. It doesn't matter. I'm not Jason's puppet. So, you pushed him? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Yes, she replied, her voice firmer now. And he resisted at first. But eventually he let me present my plan to the board. I nodded. Just as I expected. The merger went exactly as I thought. Let me ask you. Did Jason entertain you when he finally agreed to your proposal? Amy's eyes gave her away, and the sigh that followed confirmed my suspicion. Why would you think that? She asked, struggling to collect herself. I smirked at her reaction. Do you know why I was good at my job, Amy? I continued, leaning in slightly. Because I studied people, everyone I met, including you. The problem was, I let my feelings for you cloud my judgment. I trusted you blindly, and that mistake cost me. But my grandfather used to say, there's no point in getting older if you're not getting smarter. I paused for a moment, letting the words settle. I've learned to assess people by what they say, and more importantly, by what they do. If their actions align with their words, I know how to either work with them or around them. Amy sat still, listening intently, though her face showed no emotion. I pressed on. Knowing Jason's character, I don't think he cares if you succeed. If you fail... He'll distance himself and blame the board for approving your plan. She took a sip of her wine, still quiet, but I could see a flicker of realization in her eyes. If you succeed, Jason gets the credit for promoting a promising exec and boosting profits. He wins no matter what. Don't assume you have his support. He doesn't care if you pull this off or fail. So long as you keep him entertained, he's happy. You're on your own, Amy. A small fish in a big pond, surrounded by hungry piranhas. Amy gripped her napkin tightly. The fear was starting to show, but, true to form, she ignored the reality of her situation. So, you don't think I can do it? She asked, her voice tightening. No, Amy, I replied. I don't think you can. I know you can't. Her anger flared. I could see it in her clenched jaw, but I pressed on. This would be a disaster. You'd go from VP to corporate oblivion. Where would your precious security be then? From what I hear, 
all you've done is create chaos, leaving everyone else to pick up the pieces. I wouldn't be surprised if the next shareholders meeting shows a 25% profit drop. You can paint it however you like, but it all comes down to why you started this in the first place. I took a deep breath, watching her carefully, then continued. You told me you loved me, that you were doing this for both of us. Amy flinched at my words, but she nodded. But deep down, it's about your own safety, not mine. If you loved me like you say, you would have tried harder to stop me from liquidating myself with work. She blinked, confusion crossing her face. What did you say? That I was a heart attack waiting to happen? I waited for her to think it through, then leaned in a little closer. You didn't try. And if you did, you weren't convincing. You just let fear take over, waiting for me to burn out. You could have threatened me with divorce, but you didn't. I know your infidelity played a part in all this. It's why I'm here now, feeling fine. I love you, Sam, she said softly, guilt lacing her words. You love me, but you were willing to watch me work myself to pass away. Does that sound loving? I said with a bitter smile. She couldn't argue, and she couldn't meet my eyes. I didn't mean what I said back then. I love you, even now, she said, her voice shaking. But I didn't trust her, not anymore. I regret a lot of what I said too, she added. I didn't buy it. I'm sure you believe it, Amy, but love doesn't change the fact that I can't trust you anymore, whether in personal matters or business. I'm ending this conversation, I said firmly. You've made it to the top, but now you're on your own. To climb higher, you'll have to wait for Jason to step aside. Your real plan is to solidify your position and go for the CEO role. Amy opened her mouth to protest, but I stopped her. You're using me, getting me to work myself into the ground for your own gain. I can't believe you expected me to follow your orders. When I kicked you out the first time, I thought it was clear I wasn't weak. But maybe it's my fault for not letting you fail sooner. Amy looked confused, torn between guilt and defiance. You're talking nonsense, Sam. You've got it all wrong. I sighed, exhausted. You've heard the saying, sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. Well, I wasn't kind. I let you think I could be talked back into your arms, and I made Jason keep his promise to make you a VP. I didn't want to see you fail, even though you deserved it. I made a mistake by not cutting you off sooner. I stood up, checking the sauce. You wanted me to buy into your little love notes, but if I'd done what I had to... You'd be gone, starting over, hopefully a little wiser. That's what I'm telling you now. Walk away, start over. Tears streamed down Amy's face again as I spoke. You'll have to settle for a secretarial job, but that'll be better than trying to fight this. You'll be lucky if your job just involves licking stamps while some post office guy entertains you. I watched her, trying to speak thickly, but it saddened me to see defiance instead of humility on her face. I know I hurt you, Sam. I regret it every day. But what you just said is evil. You don't believe in me, yet I believe in you, she said, almost pleading. If you think that, then sit back and watch. I'll show you how it's done. Just then, there was a knock at the door. Come in, I snapped. Is everything okay, Sam? Sorry to interrupt, came Vivian's voice. I sighed, realizing I'd lost my temper. I glanced at my watch, surprised by how much time had passed. Sorry, Vivian, please don't come in. Amy was just leaving. I glared at Amy, waiting for her to get up. Amy looked at Vivian, who was younger, slender, and stunning, standing in the doorway. Amy's face twisted as she realized why she was here. She turned to me. I stared back, then saw her eyes shift to the food simmering on the stove. She seemed to understand what was going on. What? You thought this was for you? I said, my voice hardening. I told you from the start this wasn't some fancy dinner. Don't get upset because I invited a friend over. We've been broken up for years. The only reason you're here is so I can knock some sense into you. Amy jumped up, head down, and rushed past Vivian. Tell Megan I'll be waiting in the car, she muttered. Vivian looked at Amy, concerned. I hope I didn't make things worse. No, you didn't. We'll handle it. Can I tell Jillian I don't need her tonight? It's not about you. I'm glad you showed up when you did. I hugged Vivian, kissed her cheek, and added, You can watch the pasta for a minute. I need to tell Megan that the meeting's over and she can take Amy home. As I stepped outside, I saw Megan napping on the back terrace, the afternoon sun slipping behind the horizon. I couldn't help but think that Amy's words held some truth. Now that Amy was VP, she had cleared the way for my ideas. It made me reflect for a moment. How's the view? 
I asked, turning toward Megan. She smiled, keeping her eyes closed. Just like you said, Sam. Amazing. I watched her for a second before asking, How did it go in there? No fire shots? She chuckled playfully. Not well. She's not backing down. Amy's in the car, waiting for you. Megan shifted slightly and then asked, Can I ask you something? Sure, anything, I replied, still watching the sunset. I hesitated. How do you see your future at work? How ambitious are you, Megan? Megan raised an eyebrow, surprised by the question. Not sure what you're getting at, but if you mean what I think, I'd like to take Amy's job. She stood up. I know I can do it well, but I won't compromise myself for it. Why do you ask? I thought for a moment. I think it's time to end this circus. Can you connect with Kevin Paxton and meet me in town in three weeks? I might have an offer for both of you. Megan nodded and I led her inside. She saw Vivian at the stove. Vivian elbowed me and whispered, Now I get why Amy ran out of here like that, you old dog. Megan smirked, glancing at me. She's gorgeous. She's probably the final nail in Amy's coffin. Jesus, Sam, Amy never stood a chance. Not even I do. Poor girl's probably licking her wounded pride right now, Vivian added. I nodded, appreciating Megan's beauty. And she's just as beautiful inside. Vivian looked up as I introduced Megan. Nice to meet you, Megan hesitated, eyeing me. Sam seems to have so many women in his life. I'm not sure there's room for me, Megan chuckled. Don't worry about the other women. He's the only man you need to trust. And as far as I can tell, he's got his eye on you. Watch your back, girl. Sam can be a real Casanova when he sets his sights on someone he likes. I didn't know what Megan meant by that. I hadn't been around her enough for her to say that. My face reddened. I think you've said enough for one night, Megan. Time to go, I said, nudging her toward the door. Before leaving, Megan looked over her shoulder and said, If you're smart, Vivian, don't let this guy slip away. She kissed me on the cheek. Be smart, see you in three weeks. Vivian and I sat on the back deck of the Merlot, watching the waterfowl drift by. We talked about the events of the day, and I filled her in on the mess my marriage to Amy had become. You don't really want to do this, do you, Sam? Vivian asked. I shuddered at what was coming. No, I don't, but it has to be done. I can't sit by while everyone loses their jobs because I took the easy way out. As much as it hurts, I have no choice. Vivian stayed quiet for a moment, then said, If you must know, Amy still has feelings for you. I almost laughed. I knew that before, but not anymore. Not after what I told her this afternoon. I laid into her, but I don't think it made a difference. Vivian smiled. For all your toughness, it's clear you care about people, including Amy. We women appreciate that in men. I didn't have a response, so I took another sip of my beer. Vivian patted my arm as if trying to reassure me. If I'm right about you, Sam, you'll do what's best for everyone. I nodded, a grim sense of foreboding settling in. But I'm afraid not everyone will agree. Vivian shrugged. You didn't make her bed, she did. Now she'll have to lie in it. I drifted into thought, and just as I was lost in it, Vivian caught me off guard. Speaking of beds, she said, her tone teasing, when are you going to show me yours? I blinked, completely taken aback. What? Vivian chuckled. Megan told me if I wanted to claim you, I'd better not back off. What did she say? I asked, still processing the sudden shift. Vivian smiled knowingly. If you're smart, Vivian, you won't let this guy slip through your fingers. Well, she replied with a grin, I'm grabbing onto someone I think is worth holding on to. So, you're interested in more than just being friends? I asked, feeling like a nervous teenager. I didn't mean to mess this up. As you can see, my history with women isn't great. Vivian giggled. You're blushing, Sam. My ears burned and I smiled sheepishly. You sure know how to make a guy feel stupid. I rubbed my face, trying to regain my composure. When I walked into your store and saw you looking shattered and accepted my help, I felt like a knight rescuing a damsel in distress. Vivian's smile was priceless. You were my knight, and you still are. She leaned over and kissed my cheek. Since then, I've relied on you. I understand now why you've taken care of me all these months. Vivian stopped when she saw the confusion on my face. It must have been hard for you when Amy made you feel unnecessary. If it helps, I need you, Sam, Vivian said. I haven't felt this comfortable since Greg died. It's a man thing, and Amy didn't get it. I couldn't explain it either. Vivian reassured me with a pat on the arm. You've been good to me, and I appreciate it. It wasn't until Megan caused a little stir that I realized I had feelings for you. So what do you say? Want to take it to the next level? 
Vivian's expression was sincere, mixed with hope. Well, madam, if you insist, I guess I'll have to show you my etchings, I said with a sly grin. Vivian's face lit up. Forget the engravings. I'm more interested in what tool you use to make them. We both burst out laughing as she stood and headed for the door. Race you to the bedroom. Later, when I walked into the restaurant, I saw Kevin and Megan watching me. Kevin stood and offered his hand. Long time no see, old friend. You look ten years younger, he said with a grin. I smiled and shook his hand. It's good to see you two. I'm doing fine. How's life? Average to average, Kevin replied, still grinning. But no complaints. No one listens anyway. I turned to Megan and kissed her on the cheek. You look radiant, as always. I don't know what you saw in that brute, but I hope he treated you well. Megan laughed. He may be rude, but I like the rugged type. I raised an eyebrow. How do you know? Megan smiled knowingly. Because like I told Amy, I'm a people watcher. I saw how you reacted when I asked Kevin to join us. You two would make a great team. Kevin grinned. Speaking of that, what kind of offer do you have for us? I chuckled. Always straight to the point, Kevin. You'll never change. Okay, business first. Then we can relax and enjoy the food. As drinks were served, I started. The company is in serious trouble, and if nothing changes soon, everyone will be looking for work. As you both know, the options here are slim. I pulled several folders from my briefcase and handed the white one to Kevin. If you disagree or have anything to add, feel free. As Kevin flipped through the folder, I opened another one. Here's a list of people you need to get on your side. How you do it is up to you. Kevin scanned the folder in his hands. You've clearly thought this through. Not only are you going after JPL and Amy, but Dobson Inc. and Jason too. I saw the concern on his face. We have no choice. Since Dobson bought JPL, we have to hit from both sides. My initial plan focused on JPL, but now we need to target Dobson's board if we're going to have a chance. If you can get the board on your side and Megan works on JPL, we might have a shot, though it's a long shot. Kevin handed the folder to Megan. You're not kidding when you talk about Sam. Skinny is an understatement, more like anorexic, but I see the potential. I think we should involve Jack Deacon. He's a numbers guy, don't you think? I suggested. I thought for a moment before responding. Jack's a genius with numbers, but we didn't exactly get along. I don't know why, but he made it clear I wasn't his favorite colleague. Megan nodded. I agree. Jack should be involved for the creative accounting. I'll talk to him and listen first. Kevin picked up the second folder and skimmed the list of names. Not sure I could even meet some of these people, let alone bring them on board. I smirked at Kevin's doubt. What do you think I've been doing for the last three weeks? There's one name, Slovak, that's crucial. If he's not on board, this plan falls apart. Kevin raised an eyebrow. How did you become so influential? Influential? If I were that good, Slovak would already be eating out of the palm of my hand, I replied, handing him another folder. This one's for the meetings you have scheduled minus Slovak. Megan glanced up. Isn't Slovak Jerry Cambridge's uncle? Maybe he can help us get an appointment. Kevin and I exchanged a look. Kevin asked, Can you figure something out, sweetie? Megan smiled. I have a meeting with Jerry tomorrow. I'll ask him then. I felt slightly better. I've organized the times and dates for you. Things are starting to get messy, even at the top. I've outlined my concerns, but we need more details. We need everyone together to finalize this. Megan shook her head. I can't believe Jason didn't see this coming. He knows everything's falling apart, I scoffed. He just doesn't care. He's got Amy as a scapegoat. She's in for a nasty surprise when he stabs her in the back. Megan wrinkled her nose. Amy's selfish, but she doesn't deserve that. I agree, I said. Jason will have to act before the next stockholder meeting if he wants to stay clean. We need to move fast and clean. Impress the big shots, and we're in the clear. Kevin shook his head. You seem sure we'll take your offer. I smiled. Think about it. What do you have to lose if Amy can pitch her ideas? This will be easy for you. You haven't found a job that matches your skills, have you? I know you've got issues with Amy, and Jason's definitely not on your Christmas list. I nodded at Megan. And she believes in you as much as I do. Just take the reins and I've done all I can. You just need to bring it home. Kevin and Megan laughed. All wrapped up with a pink ribbon, Kevin said sarcastically. Megan frowned. What about Jason? He won't give up without a fight and he's got the power to destroy this before we even get started. I grinned darkly. Leave Jason to me. You won't even have to deal with him. Just keep Amy distracted so she doesn't figure out what's going on and mess everything up. Megan smirked. She's not a problem anymore. 
After your talk, she's so rattled she doesn't even know what day it is. Vivian really got under her skin and she's determined to prove you wrong. You really messed with her head, Sam, Megan said with a grin. We continued our meal while finalizing plans. As we parted, we agreed to meet again in two days with others to discuss the final version. The meeting was tense. Megan and Kevin had gathered a group to help push things forward, including Jack Deacon, who was immediately hostile but listened carefully. Let me see the financials, Jack demanded, and we watched as he quickly scanned the pages, adding and subtracting with impressive speed. This is nonsense, Beckman. You can't back up these numbers. I held back my frustration and replied, They're estimates, projections, Jack smirked. Don't quit your day job. I've seen more accurate weather forecasts. It's time to put up the money. I knew I had to handle him carefully. Listen, Jack, I know we haven't spoken since Amy took over, but I know you're good at this, which is why you're here. You're the best. He puffed up, a little offended. I may be a worker to you, but I'm not so clueless as to miss when I'm being patronized. I gritted my teeth. That wasn't patronizing, but it's still true. I addressed the group. What are you all going to do when the next shareholders meeting comes around? I don't care if you agree with this plan or not. I can leave and go back to my life. You guys will be figuring out how to line up for unemployment. Jack, you're a genius with numbers, and you can land a job anytime. But what about everyone else? We need you to make these numbers work. Jack paused, then asked, So this isn't some scheme to get your wife promoted? I shook my head with a sad grin. No, Jack, she's my ex-wife, and she'll be lucky if she has a desk job after this. I regret how things ended, but I'm here to fix that. Whether this takeover succeeds or not, Amy and Jason are done. Jack scanned the room, then flipped through the folder again. You know, Sam, I've been doing a lot with nothing for so long. Now I have the chance to do everything with nothing. When's the deadline for this miracle? Kevin answered cautiously. By three o'clock tomorrow afternoon? Jack's eyes widened. Holy crap, even God would have trouble sorting this out by then. We all exchanged glances, starting to doubt the plan, but then Jack surprised us all. I want a sign on my desk that says, God, if I pull this off. Kevin grinned. I'll personally engrave it, and everyone can kneel at your feet if you get us those numbers by three o'clock. Relief washed over the room. Okay, folks, we're working overtime. Apologize to whoever you need to and get to work. Megan approached me, asking if she could bring in some of the typing group for help. It's your call, Megan. Take control now. I'm just here to answer questions, I said, handing her the reins. She glared at Kevin. Sam's right. You need to pull it together, honey, and show everyone they can rely on you. Within the hour, Megan had organized teams and started brainstorming ideas. Jack pushed back, but Megan snapped at him. I don't care how many people you need, Jack. Just get it done. Kevin chuckled. You were right, Sam. She's a little firecracker. I smiled at Kevin's pride. Never doubted it, I said, tapping my temple, then went to help. I walked into Jason's office, ignoring his shocked secretary. I'm sorry, sir, but you can't go in there. Jason waved her away. It's fine, Lynn. What's the Beckman invasion about? He asked, clearly annoyed to see me. That's no way to start a negotiation, Jason. I thought someone of your business caliber would know when to be more contrite. I had a sinister, almost fake smile on my face as I stood there. Jason leaned back in his chair, waiting for me to say something. But I didn't need to rush him. I knew well that in a standoff, the first person to speak loses. After a while, Jason broke the silence, sweat starting to form on his brow. Are you just going to stand there staring at me, or are you going to explain why you're here? He glanced nervously at his watch. I've got a shareholders meeting in an hour. Here's why I'm here, I said finally. I'm here to help you pack, you idiot. And where am I supposed to go? Jason's discomfort was obvious, and he clearly didn't like the direction this was going. I don't care where you go, just as long as you're gone by the end of the day, I said, a sly grin tugging at my lips. But if I were you, I'd head to the other side of the country. And what if I don't feel like going anywhere, huh? I'm just a few years away from retiring, and I'm not throwing away my golden retirement package for the likes of you. I shook my head, unfazed. You've got two options, Jason, I said coldly. You can get up, hand in your resignation, and walk away with only what's left in your pockets. Or you can stay and watch me tear your life apart, starting with your family. You'll be lucky if you have enough left for a cup of coffee. Jason scowled, clearly trying to find a way out. I did what you asked, Beckman. I gave Amy a shot at vice president. And now she controls JPL. So why the sudden threats? We've never even met. But I always thought you were a man of your word. So what changed? 
Why are you going after me now, digging up the past? I leaned in, planting both hands firmly on his desk so my face was just inches from his. You changed my mind, you fool, I said, voice low and menacing. I kept my part of the deal until you decided to break it. Now you're going to pay for it. You sabotaged Amy in every way possible. You let her stand before the board with a plan that you knew would fail. You thought you'd get rid of two problems in one shot. Set her up to fail and knew I wouldn't step in to help. You broke our agreement and now I want what I'm owed. Jason wiped the sweat from his face as I spoke, his mind clearly racing to figure out how I knew all this. I didn't break the deal, Beckman, he protested. She came to me. I just gave her a chance to prove herself. If anyone's to blame for her situation, it's her, not me. Stop lying, I snapped, swiping a few gadgets off his desk in frustration. You had every opportunity to stop her, and everyone can see that without you, she never would have even gotten in front of the board to make a fool of herself. I pointed at him, my voice sharp. It was your choice. You made it, and now it's time to face the consequences. Resign or sit back and enjoy the destruction of your life. Jason's face shifted with every emotion under the sun. I watched him carefully as he considered his options. I seriously doubt you have the kind of dirt you think you do, he muttered, trying to look confident. I smiled, watching as he mentally tried every possible escape route, only to find them all locked tight. You really think I've been sitting on my hands all these years? I chuckled. I've got all the dirt on your shady affairs from before you ruined my marriage, and I've dug up even more since then. Corporate fraud, embezzlement, not to mention two other little secrets. I knew I was bluffing, but I was pretty sure Jason had enough skeletons in his closet to make the threat sound real. Here's your choice, Jason. Jail or retirement, I said, watching his reaction closely. I could see the panic setting in now. His eyes darted around the room, realizing that his only option left was to walk out that door, and he had no choice but to leave. Kevin Paxton is talking to your board right now, and he's got a proposal that's going to turn your life upside down. When I leave here, I'm going straight over to hand everything I've got over to them. So you better make your decision, I continued, watching the tension grow. Jason's response was quick. He hit the intercom button with urgency. Lynn, get in here with a pad and pencil. I need to dictate a letter right now. I walked over to his liquor cabinet and poured myself a scotch. You win, Beckman, Jason said defeated. I'll be gone by the end of the day. As I took a sip, his secretary walked in and sat down at his desk, ready to take dictation. No problem, Jason, I said. I don't have anything pressing at the moment. I'll drop off an email for you. Lynette could sense the tension in the room as she waited for Jason to begin dictating his letter. By the time he finished, she was struggling to keep her laughter in check and quickly left his office. I saw her reaction and realized Jason wouldn't have enough time to pack up and leave. As he walked out of his office for the last time, I called after him. I hear the South Pole is nice this time of year. Don't worry, I'm not planning to look for you there. Oh, and have a great day, Jason. A few moments later, Lynette returned and hugged me. Thank you, Mr. Beckman. I can't tell you how much this means to me. I was taken aback. Wait, what exactly are you thanking me for? Tears welled up in Lynette's eyes as she calmed herself. Jason tried to blackmail me, she said, her voice trembling. He's been making advances. It started with subtle hints, but I was worried he was going to push harder if I didn't step forward. I can't tell you how grateful I am for what you did for me. I was seething inside at the thought of Jason's actions. I had been right. Amy had served her purpose and now Jason was looking for a new target. I figured Jason's fate was sealed, and his marriage was on the line. If things go according to plan, I said, he'll only ask you to do your job and nothing more. He's a fair man who values loyalty. Lynette kissed me on the cheek again. You're officially on my Christmas list from now on, and I'll try to convince my husband to name our next son after you. She smiled. Thanks again for everything. She handed me an envelope. I've never had so much fun typing a letter before. Later, I entered the office Jason had vacated six months ago. Morning, Lynn. Is the boss in? I asked, glancing toward her desk. Morning, Mr. Beckman. Yes, Mr. Paxton is expecting you, she replied with a smile. As I reached for the door, she added, You were right, by the way. He's everything a secretary could want in a boss. Thanks again. I smiled back as I opened the door. No problem, Lynn. And call me Sam. Mr. Beckman was my father. Lynette chuckled and waved as I stepped inside. Once inside, I settled into a chair and asked, So, how does it feel to be running one of the most profitable companies on the market at the end of the quarter? 
From behind his desk, Jason's voice boomed with enthusiasm. Sam, you old fool. Where the hell have you been? How's everything? I can't thank you enough for what you've done. Especially for Megan and me. She still pinches herself every morning to make sure it's real. I raised an eyebrow. Oh, really? How do you know? Are you waking up next to her, planning a merger of your own? I teased. Kevin shrugged. Well, we're still in the negotiation phase, but it looks promising. I'm sure Megan would love for you to come to the signing, and I heard you've got a little one of your own you're taking care of. I laughed. Yeah, same story here. You had a company to save. I had one to build. Vivian is certainly being raised right. A real thoroughbred. Kevin leaned back, and the joking quieted as his expression turned more serious. Have you heard about Amy? I felt the mood shift. Yeah, Megan called me the day she was hospitalized. I guess the pressure just got to her, and she snapped. Megan wanted me to visit, maybe try to mend some fences, but I didn't see the point. Not until she got professional help. Me showing up would have made things worse. Kevin nodded, then shrugged. I think Megan felt sorry for her, but that's women for you. I'm thinking of offering her a job at JPL, maybe as a secretary. Hope that doesn't bother you. I shook my head, my frown deepening. No, it doesn't bother me. To be honest, I don't even care about her anymore. She's just someone I used to know. I hope she gets better and moves on. Kevin leaned back in his chair. So, no desire to come back to the business? I could find you a great job with a solid financial package? I grinned. Not a chance, buddy. Besides, you don't need me. From what I hear, you've got divine intervention on your side now. That made Kevin burst out laughing. Oh, I almost forgot about Jack. He got his plaque and the respect of everyone here. You were right about him. He's a real math genius. For a while, he was the hotshot. I'd walk into board meetings with him handing me financial reports just before shareholders arrived. Kevin's smile grew wider. And you know what's funny? I raised an eyebrow. What's so funny? I was just thinking about how Jack reacts when women sneak up on him. Let's see how he handles women with his math formulas. If he figures it out, I might just believe he's a god. I laughed out loud. I would have loved to be there for that. And I would have liked to sit in on the board meeting too. But like you... I had more unpleasant business to take care of. While you were grooming the board, poor Jason was sweating it out at the very table you now sit at. Kevin's grin was unmistakable. Same story, but seriously, if you ever need a job, just let me know. I shook my head. I've got everything I need now. Vivian and I have launched our own little family resort. I'm here to offer you corporate rates for Thanksgiving weekend. Maybe some good-natured contests to promote team building? Kevin nodded, clearly approving. Sounds like a plan. I think we could make a fishing contest work. That should get everyone bonding. Vivian and I were invited to Kevin and Megan's wedding, and now they have two wonderful boys. They're still a powerful duo in the business world. Every Christmas we get cards from Lynn and her family. She even convinced her husband to name their next child after me. Her daughter's name is Samantha, or Sam for short. As for Jason, he hasn't been heard from since his wife kicked him out. She tossed all his belongings onto the lawn and turned on the sprinklers. His prized Elvis-signed guitar became a necklace for her garden gnome after she dropped it on his head. Rumor has it he's hunting penguins in Antarctica now, but who knows? And Amy? After getting the support she needed to move on from everything Jason had put her through, she took Megan up on her offer for an entry-level secretary position. She sold her absurdly extravagant mansion and used the proceeds to buy a modest apartment close to work. She'll never climb the corporate ladder in the way she once dreamed, but at least she has a roof over her head and a steady job, even if she has to work hard to make ends meet until retirement. I spoke with her at the company's Thanksgiving party at the lake. She wasn't too eager to come at first, but Megan convinced her she needed a break. We had a good conversation, and she apologized for her arrogance, admitting she had overstepped. I apologized too, acknowledging that I had to make tough choices to protect everyone's jobs, even if it meant injuring her in the process. After therapy, she said she realized how misguided her thinking had been. I was glad to hear her laugh when I mentioned Jason's fall from grace. She seemed to enjoy the weekend, relaxing in the sun with her co-workers. As for her social life, I'm not really sure. Megan mentioned she occasionally goes on dates with other women, but that doesn't seem to stick with anyone for long. Honestly, I don't give it much thought, nor do I really care. It's her life now, and she's the one who has to live with the choices she's made. Six months later, Vivian and I tied the knot, and we moved her and Bessie into my cottage. One day, as she unpacked, I saw her pull a picture of her late husband from her suitcase. 
stare at it for a moment, kiss it, and gently place it in a drawer of the dressing table. The moment moved me deeply, and I walked over to her. She looked at me, uncertain, so I pulled out a picture of Glory and placed it on the table beside hers. I think Greg would want to see his wife happy, well cared for, and loved, don't you? Vivian smiled through tears and hugged me tightly. You're a good man, Samuel. I think Greg and you would have been the best of friends. My guardian angel has been watching over me for a long time. I'm so lucky to have not one but two people in my life that I can truly call my soulmates. I felt amazing. No, I felt more than amazing, better than I had in years. When Bessie is old enough, I'll make sure she knows all the wonderful things about her father. They both deserve that. Our little fishing resort continues to grow. Jillian now has an apartment above the store. She's not always the most punctual, but at least we know where to find her when things get busy. We've expanded our cabins and added private docks for weekend anglers. I spend most of my days working in the shop, handling routine boat repairs and general maintenance. Vivian still runs the store and Bessie, now five, is always underfoot. She's starting to see me as a father figure. I'm the only father she's ever really known. Last summer we gave her a big surprise, her own little brother. Brady has temporarily stolen the spotlight. But I have to admit, I spoil both of them. And my doctor's happy too. I should probably send Amy a thank you card to mark the occasion. But no, I'm just kidding. 